But we've been looking at some life lessons by a disciple called Peter. Peter is just an ordinary guy. Some of you know his story. Um, the thing I like about Peter is that when he walked with Jesus for those three years as a, as a student, as a learner, he had no idea what the Lord was preparing him for. The Lord was preparing him for not only his death and resurrection, but he was preparing his disciples for after his departure. And so Peter learned a lot of lessons and one of the most important lessons that he learned while he was walking with the Lord was this, the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to, uh, according to Francis Chan, y'all know who Francis Chan is? He's a, he's a preacher. He wrote a book and he refers to the Holy Spirit as the forgotten God. Think about that for a moment. He wrote a whole book about the Holy Spirit referring to him as the forgotten God. Because when we think about God, we think about one God, three persons. It's what we call the Trinity, Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And, and, and sometimes even in this church, uh, in a lot of churches, we, we do a lot of talking about God, the Father, rightly so. We talk a lot about Jesus Christ, our Savior, who became man like us, rightly so, who went to the cross, died for the forgiveness of sins. We are Christ followers, Christians. And then we will acknowledge Holy Spirit, but sometimes we're kind of like, you know, we don't want to really talk a lot about the Holy Spirit because, quite honestly, Holy Spirit is very powerful. And us mere humans don't really know what to do with him, but he is part of the triune Godhead. He is God. And so you can go really from two extremes, I think, in Christ, Christendom, Christian circles. You can go on, on, I guess, one extreme where you uh, don't really talk too much about the Holy Spirit. Then you go to this other extreme, and some churches, all they do is talk about Holy Spirit. In fact, they probably, on this extreme, you can go to the far extreme, and you can even start to elevate Holy Spirit above Jesus and even above the Father. And if you really look at, at the scriptures, it's very clear that there is a Godhead, there is order. The Father sends the Son. The Son submits to the Father, so there's order. Jesus Christ himself says that he and the Father send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says he brings glory not to himself, but rather to the Son. And so the Holy Spirit is important in, in our Christian walk. But it's very tough for, for churches to really understand the Holy Spirit. So in this morning, in 30 minutes, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And I'll probably confuse a lot of you. Hopefully, I'll bring some clarity to some of you. But let's just say in 30 minutes, we're not going to be able to really do justice to who the Holy Spirit is. So in saying that, um, I'm setting my timer here. I'm not actually going on Facebook. I'm of my timer here. In saying that, let's take a quick glimpse of who the Holy Spirit is. And this is just a quick glimpse of who he is. Genesis 1, verse 1, you might recall, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's talking about God creating, right? Verse 2, it says that the earth was formless and void. And it says a spirit of God, the Spirit was hovering over the waters. So the Spirit of God was present in the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the Holy Spirit was here in the creation process. He was here in the beginning. Now, you can look through the Old Testament, and you will see that he, at times, was poured out on believers. King David prayed that the Holy Spirit would not depart from him, if you remember one of his prayers. The Holy Spirit was very much present and active in the Old Testament. I'm going to fast forward to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, um, the Gospels give us this account of a virgin giving birth. So there's a miracle that must take place, right? A virgin is going to give birth. So the Scriptures tells us that this virgin, young virgin, Never had relationships, relations with a man, but she was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So somehow in her womb, the Holy Spirit was there and Jesus Christ was conceived. So a sinful woman like Mary, now I'm not saying that she's like a bad girl, I'm just saying she had sin, was able to bring forth a perfect child. Not by what she did, but by the Holy Spirit's power. The Bible, did you know that the Bible, all 66 books, were written by sinful men? Again, not bad dudes that are just like sinful people. Some of them were, but they're all sinners. And yet the Holy Spirit, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, says that all scripture is inspired by God, or God breathed. So all of God's word is from the Holy Spirit's power that allowed man to record a holy book. This, Paul writes, this apostle Paul in, in Romans, he says that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the grave, same power that raised Christ Jesus from the grave, Paul says actually lives in us. It's pretty powerful if you think about it. The same spirit, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the grave lives in us. We're going to see in a little bit that in the book of Acts chapter 2 that the church at Pentecost, Pentecost means 50, Pente 50, it's 50 days after the Passover. So at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church, on the disciples, and they receive the Holy Spirit. They receive Jesus, and at the same time, they receive the Holy Spirit. So that is what we say when the church began. The church was not in the Old Testament. That is Israel. The church is not even in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are disciples, followers of Jesus. They were gatherers. They assembled together. But the actual church with the Holy Spirit does not start till Acts chapter 2. And from 2 verse, verse on through Revelation is the church. That's who we are. We're part of the church age. See, I'm already confusing some of you. You're like, I didn't come for a history lesson i'm trying to help you understand so paul talks about this in ephesians 1 is that the you get sealed with the holy spirit when you believe in jesus holy spirit comes in you never will he leave you never will he forsake you this is upon your conversion in fact remember john chapter 3 we know this famous verse for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son finish it for me that whoever Come on. Some of y'all, y'all know this one. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. In that same passage of scripture, there's a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and Nicodemus talks to Jesus and Jesus says, you got to be born again. That's a scary word. We don't like to, be, we don't like to talk about that in church. You got to be born again, Jesus told Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says, how can I be born again of the flesh? How can I go back into my mother's womb? And he says, no, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. So Jesus will tell Nicodemus that we are all born once physically, but we must be born again of the spirit of God. So I was born June 15th, 1970 in a hospital in Harker Heights, Texas, right outside of Colleen. That was my flesh gives birth to flesh birthday. So in February of 1991, I became born again of the Spirit of God. That became my spiritual birthday. I was born again. So you're like, it's confusing, and that's fine. I'll try to unpack this as we go. All right. So there's talk about the fruit of the Spirit. You have heard of this? Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. This is all from God working in us. When the Spirit of God is working in us and through us, you should be manifesting these quali qualities. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. So, so moms and dads, when you're in a bad mood and the kids, you can come up to mom and dad and say, hey, I don't see the fruit of the Spirit. You're not being kind. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there is tension, though, because Paul also writes in that same little group of passages that you can be walking in the flesh. 
The things of the flesh oppose the things of the spirit. And sometimes what comes natural is we feed the flesh and we starve or we quench the spirit of God. But we need to starve the flesh and say yes to the things of God. Finally, here's, here's a big one. Holy Spirit um, talks about, the Bible talks about these spiritual gifts. Have y'all heard of spiritual gifts? So there's four places the Bible refers to spiritual gifts. So if you're a card player, poker player, not promoting gambling, if you're a card player, uh, you would have two pairs. Helping you remember this. 1 Corinthians 12 is the passage listed right there. That's your, that's your number 12, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Peter, well, hold on. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. So Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, that's a pair. 1 Peter 4 and Ephesians 4. Two pairs. That's where you will find the, where the Bible talks about spiritual gifts. And in the spiritual giftedness, there's all sorts. There's, um, he gave some to be administrators of the church, some to be pastors of the church, teachers of the church, helpers of the church, servants of the church, behind the scenes. But then it mentions some that we don't like to really talk about in some Christian circles. It talks about tongues and interpretation of tongues and miracles. And so a lot of times the church were like, ooh, we don't know what to do with that. And some churches, that all they want to do is talk about that. But the scripture has to speak for itself. When we see what the scripture says, then we have to let the scripture speak on these things. The Bible talks about these are gifts given to the church. And so the ch- they're given to the church so that it, we can build the body of Christ up, mature. And so w- what our role is, is to test the spirit to make sure that it is of God. But we, our job is not to quench the spirit when God is moving. That gets tough, or does it not? For some of us? Hello, wake up. McFly. Okay. Let me see. Let me check my notes. Insert a joke here <laughs> to keep them awake. All right. So, in, in saying all that, um, let's just take a look real quick about Peter. Remember, he's a fisherman, he's an average guy. He doesn't really understand this whole Holy Spirit thing, but it's gonna, he's going to find the importance of, this Holy, of the Holy Spirit. So that's a kind of an overview of who the Holy Spirit is through the scriptures. Let's take a closer look now at the disciples. So when Jesus was with his disciples, right before he would go to the cross, okay, right before he would go to the cross, he was preparing them for a lot of things. And one thing that he tells them, and this is what he says in chapter 15 of John, he says, when the advocate comes whom i will send to you from the father notice that jesus is going to send the advocate from the father says the spirit of truth who goes out from the father he will testify about what about what it's right there go ahead and read it about me So Jesus is going to send from the Father, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to testify about himself? No. About who? Jesus. So you see the role of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Jesus hasn't gone to the cross yet. This is John chapter 15. I would encourage you today when you go home, read John chapter 15, John chapter 16, John chapter 17. Because he's preparing them for sending the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. Next chapter, and I'm skipping a bunch of stuff, so it's your job to go home and double check what I am telling you because I could just be cutting and pasting all over the place just to make a point. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help you understand bits and pieces of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so in John chapter 16, verse 7 says, But verily, truly, I tell you, Jesus is speaking, it is for your good that I am going away. He's telling his disciples this. It's for your good that I'm going away. They're like, don't leave us. We've been with you for three years, Jesus. What are we going to do when you leave us? And he's telling us, guys, when, you, when I leave you, it's for your, actually for your own good. And then he says, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus is going to the cross. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. He's telling these disciples, I got to go, and it's good for me to go because my rightful place is not here on earth. My rightful place is to die, to resurrect, 
with a glorified body and to send back up into glory, sit at the right hand of the Father where, I'm rightfully, where I rightfully belong. And that's going to be my job. In fact, Jesus says when he's on the cross, he says to Telestai, it is finished. His whole purpose in coming to this earth, being born of a virgin, living a perfect life, was to die on the cross. That was his whole mission. And Jesus, faithful to the end, checks it off. It is done. I've done my job. But he says, now I'm going to send you Holy Spirit because the work is just about to begin. Jesus Christ spent three years public ministry and is all within this Jerusalem area. He didn't go too far. But the work is now going to go viral. His work, it's going to go around the world. But it's not going to be through one man, Jesus Christ. It's going to be through his body, the believers. All right, so... Here, let me just walk you through some of these things. That passage referred to him as advocate. If some of you are reading your Bible, did y'all have another word for advocate? That Jesus said, I'm going to send you a what? Helper. Some translations say helper. What else? Some of y'all are not even reading your Bibles. So here's what some of the translations say. Comforter. You, you think You ever wonder why Jesus would send the comforter? I, I, I was listening to this, um, well, I was reading this, this article in this, about the Holy Spirit, and one of these guys said that the American church today does not necessarily need a comforter. He says, because we're pretty comfortable. So the American church today, you know, we have, you know, all the bells and whistles. We have beautiful buildings, air conditioned, by the way, our air condition is fixed. If you were here last week, it was hot. We have, not us, but some people have nice chairs. <laughs> you know, and a big stage and like band and lights and smoke and, you know, all the strobe lights and all this, you know, children's ministry. And some churches have like a big slide for the kids, you know. I, I'm just telling you, this is reality for churches in America. Some churches, are people come in and they want to be comfortable because after all, we're Americans. And we come and we're like, you know, and then we critique. We're professional critiquers. And we walk out of there. Oh, it's too hot. Oh, it's too cold. Oh, I don't like the children's ministry. I don't like the whatever. I don't like the sermon. I don't like the song selection. Like, whatever. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. If he didn't like it, it's a different story. But you, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. And so... Here's the thing. Here's the reality, though. There are Christians all over the world today. Africa. Asia. The Middle East. They're being persecuted for their faith. And they need comfort. And Jesus says, it's okay. I'm going to send you the comforter to comfort you. I'm going to send you an advocate, one who speaks on your behalf. When you don't know what to say, I'm going to give you the power to speak my name. I'm going to encourage you because you're going to need encouragement. And I'm going to give you one who brings counsel and wisdom because this is my spirit, says the Lord. As Christians, we need to, to like Angelo said earlier, we need to surrender ourselves to, to the Lord in every area of our life because we need him. Some of you, I, in the last week and a half, I have seen death up close. I have been to the hospital twice, two different people. One with a terminal four stage cancer. And the other one is not doing well, recovering from a stroke and a bunch of other things. And, and I say all this because I've talked to family members, I've sat with family members, and there's nothing that I can say that can bring them peace, but I know there is one, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, but the one who is also an encourager in time of need is the Spirit of God. Is that sometimes when you have such a heavy spirit, you and I, we need the Holy Spirit's comfort. We need more of Him. So, okay, so Jesus like he said, goes to the cross. He dies on the cross. He does what he said he's going to do. He's buried according to the scriptures on the third day. He rose again. 
Now, he goes and he talks to his followers. And right now, there's about 120 of them. So in Acts chapter 1, this is what is recorded in Acts chapter 1. Remember, he's right before he's about to go up into heaven, he meets with them. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Here's the command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Verse 5. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will baptize with the Holy Spirit, or you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this is right before he's going up. He's already talked to them about it, and he is meeting them once again. This is important. Remember, this is the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was here in the creation, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave, the same Holy Spirit that has given us the Bible. The same Holy Spirit that took a virgin and brought forth life, Jesus. This is powerful. He says, in a few days, you're going to have him. And you know what their response is? I mean, if Jesus told me I'm going to have that much power in a few days, I'd be like, oh, man, help me understand this. Look look what these these knuckleheads do in verse 6. Verse 6, then they gathered around him and they asked him, because remember, he just told them, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And then verse 6, they're like, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So they're still thinking horses and chariots, and we're going to overthrow the Roman government. And Jesus, you said you're a king, and you said that you are the king of kings. And is this it? Because we've been waiting for you, Jesus, and you died, and we thought it was over. But you're back. So is this it? Are we going now? I mean, Peter's still packing heat. Because he's got that sword. So we're ready. And so he says, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Guys, it's a need to know basis. (laughs) You don't need to know this. But this is what you do need to know. Verse 8. Here's your marching orders. This is our marching orders. But you will receive power. That Greek word power literally means what we translate English, dynamite. Explosive power. You're about to receive explosive power. And why are you going to receive this explosive power? When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, where they're at. Remember he told them to stay in Jerusalem. But he says you're going to move from Jerusalem to Judea. If you look on a map, it's the next region over. From Judea, cross-cultural, you're going to Samaria. And then from Samaria, it says you're going to the ends of the earth. This is what the 120 are given the Holy Spirit to do. is to take the gospel to the outermost parts of the world. You remember Matthew 28? Some of y'all, Matthew 28... This is the mission of the church. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, All authority in heaven has been given to me, Jesus says. Therefore, he gives it to them, gives it to us. Go make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son. And don't forget about the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I am with you always to the very ends of the age. That's the marching orders of the church. So, I'm skipping now. Again, if you have your Bibles, check on your own. I'm skipping ahead. Look, I'm go- chapter 1, verse 8. Bam, chapter 2, verse 1. I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm just letting you know I'm skipping ahead. So here's what they've been waiting for. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, 120 of them. Suddenly a sound like blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were, where they were sitting. Just a quick story here. I'll just interject this. So, it's been two years this month since my father passed. And if you were here last two years ago, you kind of watched me watch my father 
go through the last couple of weeks of his life and even days of his life. So around 1 o'clock in the morning, we're all asleep. My father's breath is, you know, his breathing is getting real shallow. My brother wakes me up, and we go, and we basically know it, the time has come, and we tell our dad goodbye. And if you've ever been around death, you know there's a lot of things that follow. You've got to call, and they've got to come and pronounce the person dead, and then they have to basically take the body. So between 1 and 3 in the morning, we're sleep-deprived, we're tired, we're grieving, we're missing our dad, and my mom is there. And, and so you get a knock on the door, boom, 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 and it's creepy because you open the door, and these guys are wearing all black suits, 3 in the morning, and they're there with that little gurney. It's just like the creepiest thing in the world. And you know why they're there, and so you invite them in, and they go, and then we all go outside the building, the house. And the door opens up, and, and then they're taking my father's body away. And here's, here's, here's where I'm going with this. My sister has this 100-year-old pecan tree in her backyard. Big, beautiful tree. Summer night, just like this, it's just humidity, still, quiet. And uh, they're taking my, my father's body by us, and my mom begins to lose it, and, and you know, we all begin to lose it, because we know this is it. This is the last time we're going to see our, our dad. And all of a sudden, this powerful wind literally felt like a storm just blew through the backyard. This tree just starts rocking back and forth. It's just this so powerful wind. And the words that came out of my mouth to my mom... This is not biblical what I'm telling you. But the words I told my mom, I said, that is dad telling us goodbye. And I think that those words brought her a little comfort. It brought me comfort. But more recently, I, I want to believe, I don't know for sure. I'm not going around looking for signs and wonders and just for the sake of signs and wonders. But I, I want to believe that that was really what Luke is describing here blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I want to believe that was the Holy Spirit just giving us peace. I want to believe that was the comfort that we needed because when that wind blew through there, that tree was rocking and then it just, like it never happened. And I'll be honest with you, I needed that. I felt like I have comfort now because I know that the dad is with the Lord. So, I believe the Holy Spirit is very powerful. We can't figure him out. We can't contain him. But, but I believe that day his spirit manifested to me and to my family because we needed that comfort that can only come from him. So in verse 3, they, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire and separated and came to rest upon each one of them. Verse 4 says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So let me kind of break down to you what's taking place here. Remember, Jesus had told them, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the outermost parts of the world. If you look at, at the rest of this text, you see that there are nations represented from all over the place that speak different languages. It would be just like going to, uh, where's Phil, Philip? Philip, by like going to Rio, if you follow him on Facebook, he was in Rio for the Olympics. So you probably met people from all over the world. Probably spoke languages you didn't understand. So if you look at the Olympic Village and you have all these nations represented, you can't talk to them. Holy Spirit is poured out, and all of a sudden they begin to speak in these tongues where now people can understand one another. It's a miracle. They can understand what I'm saying. In fact, when they, read, when they heard this, they thought it, they were drunk. They're like, what? How can you all be speaking these different languages? These were known languages because these people could understand so right after this, the Holy Spirit makes it possible for Peter 
to have power to preach to all these people so the gospel might be spread. So this is what happens. Remember, Peter, if you were here a few Sundays ago, he denied Christ to a little slave girl, two slave girls. Have you ever felt like the Lord was asking you to talk to somebody about Jesus and you just didn't do it? Maybe. I know I have. I know I've had opportunities to talk to people and I just, for whatever reason, I didn't do it. He had opportunities to talk about these, Jesus to the slave girl. He denied him three times. You hear the rooster crow. So now he's going to learn from this lesson because the Holy Spirit now is empowering him. This is what he says. Then Peter stood up along with the 11. And he raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. And he says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem... Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Now, remember, the Holy Spirit's poured out. People are speaking in tongues. There's chaos. People are laughing, think they're drunk. They don't know what's going on. Peter stands up and he addresses the crowd. He's like, let me explain to you. And Peter preaches a sermon. And and most of you can't appreciate this. I can because I'm a preacher. But Peter does not prepare for the sermon. It's just he gets up and begins to preach. And if you go and you look at his sermon, and it's in there, it's recorded in there. It's like 30 verses. If you go and you read his sermon, it's very basic. There's, it's, it's, it, the first part of it talks about who the Holy Spirit is. and it's, it's quoting some prophets from the Old Testament, why the Holy Spirit's poured out. Then it talks about who Jesus Christ is and why he came, why he died. And then he flips it on him and talks, talks to them about they need to put their faith in Jesus Christ. I love that it's a very basic sermon. You know why? Because the scripture is full of basic sermons. You've heard of a guy named Apostle Paul? Paul says something in the Bible. He says that I did not come with wise or persuasive words, but rather by the Spirit's power. So that man wouldn't put their faith in me, but rather on the, the Spirit of God. You know, in Acts chapter 20, Paul is talking and he's preaching a sermon. Some of y'all know the story. They're in the upper room, third floor. It's hot. People are falling asleep during Paul's sermon. One guy falls out the window because he falls asleep. Three stories and dies. I've had a lot of people fall asleep in my sermons. But I have not had anyone die yet. (laughs) Paul goes and brings him, miracle, brings him back to life. You ever heard of this old guy by the name of Billy Graham? Have you heard of Billy Graham? It's amazing. The younger generation, they haven't heard of this guy. He's one of the greatest evangelists that has ever lived in our lifetime. He's about to die. I think he's in his 90s. But he has, he has spoken at rallies where, you know, 50, 60,000 people in coliseums and arenas. And if you listen to his messages, I would ask you to go back and look at, listen to some of his messages. They're very basic. I remember one time watching a Billy Graham crusade on TV, and I'm thinking to myself, this is how prideful I am. I was like, I can do better than that. And then after his message, like 30,000 people become saved and i'm like you gotta be kidding me that how that was like a basic message because it has nothing to do with billy graham it has nothing to do with apostle paul it has nothing to do with peter it has nothing to do with us it has to do with the spirit's power our job is just to proclaim jesus and let the spirit of god work in people's lives and so i find encouragement with passages like this where peter gets up and he preaches and you should too. God can use guys like you. You know when I was visiting this guy um, in the hospital? Stephen Cochran, he's not here today, um, but it's his dad. And his dad, you know, he, would, he would, could use your prayers. So his dad, Edmund, some of us know Edmund, 
I'm visiting him in the hospital, and we're there. I'm there. We're just talking, and he begins to tell me about his ministry when he was healthy, how he would go out and go door to door and knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. Now he's hooked up to all these machines, laying in bed, and he he shares this with me. This is really cool. He said he said he said, Pastor, I can't go to church anymore. And he says, not that I don't want to go to church. He said, but um, he said I can't physically. I can't do it. And he said, but I'll tell you what happened the other day. He said, it was late at night. This, they come in, they check your vitals late at night, the nurses. And he said, this nurse came in and started drawing blood. And he looked at this, this young lady who was drawing blood. And, and Edmund looks at her and he says, ma'am, he said, um, are you afraid to die? And the lady looks at him and she's like, um, no, not really. And he says, because you realize we're all going to die. And so the lady's like drawing his blood. And he says, do you know where you're going to be when you die? And now it's getting, getting uncomfortable because the lady's like, I'm just trying to draw your blood. You know, leave me alone. <laughs> but he, uses, he used the simple imagery of Jesus giving him lifeblood. He said, I know where I'm going to go when I die. He said, I'm going to heaven. And she said, well, how do you know for sure? And he begins to share who Jesus is, why he came, why he, why he died. And he, he looked at this, this young lady and he said, ma'am, he said, Going to heaven is a free gift. Would you like to go to heaven? Because all you got to do is receive this free gift. And so, you know, he talked about this young lady wanting to receive this free gift. This is what the scripture calls us to do. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, San Antonio Hospital to the outermost parts of the earth. There's going to be some people that don't want to hear the message, and that's not for you to convert. I was so inspired by talking to this man at the hospital that I went and talked to this other person that I had seen for the last week, and he was, a, he was an atheist. And we began a dialogue about who Jesus is, and he began to dialogue about what he believed, and we began to talk, and I quickly understood that this guy is not going to, he's, he has no interest whatsoever. And so the scripture tells us to just dust our sandals off, and move on. But a lot of us, we want to show how much we know and try to debate them and try to prove them wrong and science this and this and that and atheist this. And, and all we're doing is arguing in our flesh. But we're called to be ambassadors. We're called to be witnesses. We're called to speak the name of Jesus and let the Spirit of God do what he's going to do. It's the Spirit of God converts, not us. We're simply messengers. Verse 40, here's the... Here's the result. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message, message were baptized. They believed in Jesus and the spirit of God entered them at that moment. And the Bible says that there were 3,000 people were saved that day by Peter's basic message. So if you have placed your faith in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. But sin, guys, keeps us from walking in His power. So here's the tension for us. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. February of 1991, or 93, I became a born-again Christian. I'm going to heaven, not because of what I do, not because I'm a pastor, not because I read the Bible, not because it's because of what Christ did for me at the cross. He forgave me, past, present, future. It's a free gift. If you have received Christ Jesus, then you now are born of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is living in you. Here's what. Here's the thing, though. We can still, if we're not careful, fall into sin. We play with temptation and we fall into sin. Sin, though it's paid for, keeps us from walking with the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are a believer here this morning, you have the Spirit of God in you. Campus Crusade for Christ has this material that that 
I learned many years ago, and, and I wouldn't just throw this out to you. Here, here's kind of what it is. They call it spiritually exhaling. Just like you breathe in, and then you exhale. They say, and I agree, that we need to confess sin daily. When you find yourself in sin, confess it to the Lord. Exhale. And then inhale by yielding your life to the Holy Spirit's power. In other words, like Angelo said, there's some areas in our life that we give the Lord 99% of our, and there's still one or two areas in our life where we're like, ah, oh, this is mine. You need to surrender it all. If you surrender it all, God is going to use you far greater than what you could ever imagine. There's so, some of us in this room are still trying to do things in our own strength, and it could be, it, you know, I'll, I'm not going to even give you examples, but you know, God has a plan. It's a better plan than our plan. Our job is just submit to his plan. Let me close with a couple of questions. So here's some response to the Holy Spirit this morning. So the first question I'll ask you is this. This is between you and God. Do you understand the role of the Holy Spirit? Because he is the one who brings comfort. He is the one that helps us follow Jesus. And he is the one who brings power for us to share him with the world. And then the second question is this. Are you walking in the Spirit's power? Are you letting him have his way?